will be friendlier, I have a feeling. So was Manhattan, actually. So we're going to begin because there are time constraints for our speakers. So welcome to the uh, May meeting of the Transit Riders Council. May we have an approval of today's agenda. Make a motion. Second. All right. Terrific. Um, we're going to be moving right into our presentation as our folks who are doing this have to go. So a pleasure to introduce John O'Grady, Senior VP of uh, Capital Corporate Program Manager, I forget the titles these days, and uh, Lois Tendler and Peter Caffiero, um, who will make the L train presentation. Obviously, there have been a couple of community meetings. There are continuing meetings with elected officials, and tonight there's a meeting out in Canarsie. So, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, we're very happy to be here. This is the continuation of what has become a roadshow, which we were taking to all parts of the L constituency over the next several weeks and months. Uh, Mr. O'Grady and his guys are going to build what we're talking about, and Mr. Caffiero and his folks are going to make sure that while we build it, our customers have alternative methods to travel. Um, we're going to show you two presentations today. One is about the L train work, and one is about work we have to do in advance of the L train work on Bushwick, on the Bushwick Viaduct, on the M line. They're, they're, they're chock full of information and stats. Um, um, it's, it's a lot of stuff we're throwing at you, but you have a good, you, you definitely come with a higher level of understanding than the audiences we've been presenting to. Um, we would ask that you let us go through the presentations and then we're happy to entertain all your questions. Otherwise, I think, I feel we would never get through them. So um, this is a little tag team between Mr. O'Grady and Mr. Caffiero. I'll butt in when I feel the need. So why don't we start with the L? Good afternoon. Speaking too loud. <clears throat> so as um, everybody knows, Superstorm super storm Sandy was the worst natural disaster ever to hit New York City transit system. That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> From a degree of magnitude of impact, it did flood nine of the 14 under river tunnels that are shown here on this slide. Canarsie, Clark, Rutgers, Steinway, all the way on down to 53rd. We're here today to talk about Canarsie. So. You know, as a reminder of the, the degree of flooding and the magnitude of damage that it caused, this is a, a, a view of South Ferry Station. Uh, after the storm departed the city. As you can see, we pretty much flooded up to the upper mezzanine, which means that below, what connects to here was also flooded. So this, is a, this, this station has a cross connect over into, uh, uh, over into Whitehall Street Station, which in turn flooded Montague. So you start to understand the system vulnerability and how the flooding can occur and the degree of damage that it can cause. Similarly, you have a view here of, a, of a nice calm waters in the Cranberry Tunnel. Um, this is well after the storm as well, and essentially you can see that we, uh, you don't see in the photo here, but the pumping had already been underway. Again, you start to understand the magnitude of the damage it can cause. What you see on the right-hand side of this photo is an outline of the shelf. That's a duct bank. So any of the cables within that duct bank basically would have flooded as a result of the storm, and those cables are what provides the necessary power communication signals, et cetera, to allow for a safe operation of a train through an under-river tunnel. Next. Again, you get a view here of the tunnel right across the street. Um, <clears throat> the entry point flooded, flooded basically to the ceiling and then out on into the street. Right. I happen to uh, personally like this, uh, this, this particular photo or this slide uh, a lot because it shows the degree of effort that must go into rebuilding the innards of an under-river tunnel. So what you're seeing on the left is demolished duct bank. And what you're seeing the worker do right with this particular photo is he's cutting out some of the cable. So what most folks don't understand is the cables that we have to provide power and or negative return in this tunnel, they are very substantial in size. And as you can see from this photo, this is a couple inches in diameter. This does not kind of just pull out nice and easy. It has to be cut using a power saw, has to be removed in very small sections, 
And the idea afterwards is uh, after the demo is done and we are cleaned this all up, we would come in and rebuild the section of duct bank here and pull in all new cable work. So it just, just trying to illustrate what's involved in this work. Montague was uh, the first under river tunnel that we uh, took, took to try to uh, fix from Sandy. Uh, we started it in 2013, uh, end of September 2013, and we were basically done by, the, by September 2014. It was closed for 13 months. We had thought we were going to need a 14 month closure, but we were able to finish it three weeks ahead of schedule. Um, Montague had, a, has a, had about 65,000 daily commuters, um, and, an, and it was a job that showed that the work, once you embark on a project like this to do the work uh, on, under a full closure, the challenges that you would face in doing that work. The key, of course, also is Montague had uh, that number of commuters affected, but there were a lot of other alternative routes to get very close to the same stations. <coughs> So I was going to say that just a little bit on this slide, but 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 that's all right. the the idea The idea here is is that Montague was one level of challenge. So the Canarsie is a challenge that's significantly greater. So the significance of that increased challenge is not just in the number of riders, but it is also in the volume of work, which we will get into a little bit. There's a significant amount of additional work that we have to accomplish when we do the Canarsie tube. All right. Canarsie was built in 1924. It's cast iron tunnel sections with a concrete liner. The concrete liner is, for the most part, in very good shape. It's what's built from within that concrete liner that actually is what needs to be uh, rebuilt. Um, it's two tubes in each direction, each tube carrying one track, 40 trains per hour, or basically 20, or, or basically 20 uh, trains in, in either direction. And there's 225,000 riders that go through the Canarsie Tunnel on any given weekday. So um, the yellow is, oops, sorry. I should know this by now, being at the board meetings. But the, the L uh, as a whole carries about 400,000 riders. Uh, it's actually, there's, there's a video that you can see online that we also show at the meetings that, that talks about the L by itself would be the 10th largest subway system in North America, just a little less than the, the BART system in its entirety. It's about 400,000 riders. About 225,000 of those trips use the tunnel itself. So a substantial number, 125,000 people on the L never use it beyond Brooklyn. Some of them connect to other lines to go into Manhattan or, or else travel within Brooklyn. And 50,000, and this is something that we found that was pretty interesting, 50,000 people just use it within Manhattan. Uh, to put it in perspective, on the street above it in Manhattan is the M14 bus, which is one of our largest bus routes, carries 35,000 people. So the, the L is a substantial mover in Manhattan. About half of those are coming from First Avenue, uh, residents of Stuyvesant Town, as well as people going to the, the hospitals and other uh, employment over there. And the other, uh, this chart, uh, the map on the right, shows that of those uh, 225,000 riders coming through the tunnel, what stations do they exit at? Not transfer, but actually exit the system. And what, what you see here, which is another thing that was just interesting, is how dominant 14th Street is to this market. So the number of people, uh, obviously there's a number of people going up to Midtown in particular, uh, but a lot of people just getting along f out on 14th Street, which is, again, a challenge for how we maintain alternate services. I'm sorry, it was very extensive. Um, Seven million gallons of silt-laden salt brackish water uh, flooded the tunnel. The there was damage to the structure, there was damage to the track, track ties, rails, fasteners, and plates. There was damage to all the signal equipment, all the electrical equipment. So <clears throat> the process of assessing that damage and recognizing that that damage is not something that can be sustained over a long period of time, we did go in and do an extensive amount of temporary repair, ran a lot of, ex of, of 
temporary uh, replacement cables. But once the damage is assessed and the understanding of what you're going to see in some of the follow-up slides, it became evident that we literally had to do a kind of a full uh, rebuild of the internal of the tunnel similar to what we did in Montague. Want to take this? This is, a, this is a cross section through a tunnel that starts to show you what's involved. So you see the duct banks in the lower quadrant uh, uh, of, the, of each on either side of the tube. Those du the duct banks will house and protect uh, different electrical systems. The duct bank itself becomes an emergency evacuation path should we have to evacuate a train in the middle of the tunnel. And it also, be, it also provides a clear up location for, location for maintenance workers who may have to go through the tunnel under traffic and essentially um, assess a condition and determine what needs to be done. Those workers would need a location where they could get out of the way of train traffic. So that's what a duct bank is, and that's the functions that it, that it serves. Here's a view of some of the damage in the Under River Tunnel. Again, this is a circuit breaker house. There are two circuit breaker houses. This is what provides power to the third rail. There are two that serve the uh, Canarsie Under River Tunnel. This is one of the ones. This is the result of that, that equipment being underwater. Um, we, we repaired on a permanent basis, or we're, we repaired, I'm sorry, on a temporary basis, one of the circuit breaker houses. And we are nursing that tunnel through on that one circuit breaker right now. Circuit Breaker House. <clears throat> this is a view of a duct bank section that has collapsed. Um, what you're seeing here is the outer concrete protection on the duct bank has broken away. It fell onto the tracks, and that's what we need to avoid. So understanding that this happened a couple of months after Sandy, what we've done is we've gone through the, through the, uh, through the tunnels. We've inspected the duct bank sections to, to remove uh, badly deteriorated sections. We rebuilt, as an example, this particular section on a temporary basis, and we secured other sections. But we need to go in here and we need to actually rebuild these sections because, uh, as you'll see in some of these other photos, they're, 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 the duct bank itself is in a very deteriorated condition. Another, another bad thing with the duct bank being uh, breaking away like this is the fact that the cable work that we rely on is exposed. So it wouldn't take much of a track fire to expose the, the insulation on that cable and essentially cause a problem with the operation of trains through that tunnel. So you can start to see in this photo the cracking of the duct bank and how bad things are. And that's the kind of issue that we need to remedy. Okay. So we, we, we understand and know that we have to fix this, uh, fix this tunnel. Uh, in the meantime, we have to keep it safe. I'm not, we want to make sure that we project out that the, uh, we are not ignoring the safety aspect of, the, of, the, uh, of this tunnel while we are waiting for this project to kick off. We are being extremely vigilant in monitoring the condition of the tunnel, making sure that everything is secure while understanding that we have to get in here as soon as we can. And as we get into this discussion, as soon as we can is the beginning of 2019. There is some risk to us if we don't award this project. Uh, this is not the reason to do the project, but it is one of the reasons that we would like to proceed with as quickly as possible an award of the project, which is that the federal funding that we have is we've had since 2014. So we do need to show the effort of commitment of that funding in order to maintain a hold on that funding. It's vital for the Canarsie Tunnel on a long-term basis. Some of the repairs that are needed, 37,000 feet of duck bank. That's well over seven miles of duct bank. Two new circuit breaker houses. Rehabilitated vent shafts. The vent shafts are what allowed the Under River Tunnel, this Under River Tunnel to flood. The one in, uh, on Avenue D in Manhattan and the North 7th Street vent shaft in Brooklyn all allowed water to flood the Under River Tunnel. And we're going we're to harden those vent shafts, rehabilitate them, as well as we're going to rehabilitate the pump room, which is at the lower part, the low point of the Under River Tube. In addition, we'll be adding three new substations. The point of adding these substations is to allow for future growth uh, or additional trains on the Canarsie line. We're going to be doing station enhancements. In other words, we're taking advantage of these closures <clears throat> in order to provide as much additional work as we can 
that is necessary to help improve the station. So as an example, at, at, Ave at First Avenue, for, uh, for those that know First Avenue Station, there, there's, a, there's a significant need for additional stair capacity, and we're going to be adding stair capacity at the Avenue A end of the First Avenue Station, and we also will be adding um, elevator uh, accessibility. So there will be ADA accessibility to the station while this project is underway. Bedford Avenue is an ADA key station. We'll be adding staircases as well as elevators at the, at the, Driggs, at the North 7th Street end of Bedford Avenue station, and we'll be adding stair capacity, additional stair capacity at the Driggs Avenue end of, uh, of uh, that station. The intent is to make sure that this tunnel is, or is, uh, is basically around for a much longer period of time um, you could, you could put another 50 years onto the life of this tunnel with this work, if not longer. And while this area of Brooklyn needs, a lot of suggestions have been made that we need an alternate tunnel. An alternate tunnel will take much longer to build and plan and build than, than r repairing the Canarsie Tunnel. So what you're seeing in this image is renderings of what this station will look like when it's completed. Here you're seeing a cross section through the Avenue A end of First Avenue Station. That's the image on the left where you're starting to see two new stairs and an elevator on each side of the uh, First Avenue Station at Avenue A. Each side of 14th Street. I apologize. That's correct. Each side of 14th Street. And then you're seeing a mezzanine plan here of Bedford Avenue, the right-hand side, where you're seeing two, uh, you're seeing the additional stair capacity. Um, this happens to be the Driggs Avenue end. We have a similar rendering that shows you the other end of the station where you have elevators. But you're starting to get a feeling that for, for both of these stations, we're coming back after this project is done with these stations in much better condition than, than uh, they are currently. If, if anybody hasn't been to Bedford, um, almost any time of the day or night even, it's probably, I mean, I, we've not done this calculation, but I would would bet that this is the most heavily used station per square foot that we have out there. It's a very tiny, cramped station that is very, very busy, woefully underserved all the time. Two in the morning, it's it's very busy, and we need desperately need more stairs. It, it's a key station to put the elevator. The only way to put an elevator in remove stairs, so we have to figure out ways to add back and 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 more stair capacity. Uh, Avenue uh, First Avenue is equally uh, overwhelmed right now and has only one entrance at the far western end of the station at First Avenue, but the station itself goes to Avenue A. There's a lot of development further east in the Lower East Side. It would be a lot more convenient as well as having the additional capacity and the ADA accessibility to do that. So that combined with the substation work was part of um, a core capacity application that we got a federal grant for independent of the Canarsie of the Sandy work, uh, but to address the fact that the L train ridership has grown by, is, is almost tripled in the last 20 years or so, and uh, we're in, our current constraint on being able to add more services is, is no longer the signal system, it's the amount of electricity we can feed to run trains and the station capacity at some of these key stations to handle the extra people. So that's, that's why we're tackling that. And as uh, John mentioned, it actually is, is more efficient and less customer impact to do it combined with the two projects than it would be to do them separately. We're certainly not adding to the length of the impact to do all this work uh, at once. A couple of options in terms of the service that people always ask about, and John alluded to one of them. Uh, first of all, you know, do this nights and weekends like we're doing. Uh, seven of the other nine uh, tunnels are being done with night and weekend uh, work. I think, uh, as John showed you, the amount of work that we have to do, this is actually even more so than what we did with Montague, and the only way to do that for a whole host of reasons is to, is to shut it down long term. Uh, for a number of reasons, if we tried to do it on the weekend, the weekend would be something like, Friday night to, to Wednesday afternoon before we could restore service. So just really, uh, and it would take decades to do that. So we really, it's not a feasible option. Also, because of the way the L train market is, there's an equally night and weekend uh, market to it as well. So uh, it, it's just a complicated scenario all around. The 
concept of building a new tunnel to replace this, we just don't have the time to do that, and the, and the, uh, the money and the approvals and all of that would, would take uh, a very long time, and it's just not a feasible option. So what we, we did look at um, a number of different alternatives and variations, uh, but, but essentially they boil down to two concepts. Uh, right now, based on the amount of work that needs to be done, what John and his, his, his in-house folks, but also some uh, external consultants, several actually, that we brought in experts in this to look at this, have estimated it's about 18 months of work on each track. So we really can either do them both at once in an 18-month period or do one track at a time, 18 months each, or three years, 36 months for the, the whole work. Uh, we all thought initially that keeping one track open would be, um, would have some significant advantages to, to continue to be able to move people. But as we got into it, we realized that there were pluses and minuses with both sides. And we've been out um, showing that uh, to at the various meetings um, that we've been through. So on the, the full closure, what we would provide, first of all, is uh, what we're calling near normal. It'll be somewhat reduced in the rush hour, but still uh, adequate capacity for everyone from Rockaway Parkway to Bedford Avenue. So in Brooklyn, the, the intra-Brooklyn trips would still be able to happen as they do today. Um, but we would not be able to run, obviously, under the river because both tracks would be closed, nor would we be able to run trains in Manhattan because while the track there would still be available, there would be no way to get equipment back and forth in terms of the necessary inspections and, and maintenance and, and all that would have to happen over an 18-month period. So we would address, and I'll talk about some of the substitute services, uh, but we clearly would need significant uh, replacement service in Manhattan and across the river. Uh, but within Brooklyn, it would be near normal. For the three-year option, where we would keep one track open, uh, the key to remember and what Chairman Prendergast often says is, is we would only be able to accommodate about one in every five riders if we did that in a traditional single track where one train in and then another train out. Uh, right now the L train runs every, in the rush hour every three to four minutes. Um, with a traditional single track, the best we could do is about every 15 minutes. It's a long stretch from Bedford into to Third Avenue where the switch is. Uh, we came up with a slightly improved option where we just run the train from 8th Avenue to Bedford. Uh, that will, we can probably sustain at least in the rush hour a 12-minute service on that. Uh, middays, off-peak would be 15. And have, again, the near normal service from Canarsie to Larimer. The uh, reason we don't end up with a rail connection there is twofold. One is uh, we need some part of the track in Bedford Station to be able to have the contractors access the tunnel from that direction. And so the trains couldn't pull all the way in the station. But even if they could, we don't have the capacity in that station to handle all those people. Again, one in five would be able to squeeze on the train, and, and, and it would not be a safe situation. So this service plan would allow us to basically serve the Bedford market into Manhattan, but break the link from Bedford out to, to the rest of Brooklyn, and we'd have a bus service connecting those. Um, so in summary, and I've, I've talked about this a bit, but basically the, the one and a half year closure is, as, we, as we've said, just get in, get it out, get it done. Um, and I'll talk about some of the advantages of that. Uh, I basically covered everything else. We'll talk about the ferries and the buses. In both of these alternatives, there will be some night and weekend closure as prep work before, before this happens. Uh, that's just a factor. Uh, President Haken, when she gives this presentation, talks about making lists of pros and cons when you have to make a big decision like this. And so she asked us to do that for this presentation. The pros of the, the what we call option A, the two-track closure, is 80% of the riders are less of impacted, and, and, and that's because they're basically impacted the same, whether it's one track or two track. These are the people from Lorimer to Canarsie. Uh, they just have a, it's a shorter period of time. It's a one and a half years instead of three years of that impact. The other big factor that, uh, that John talks about often is by giving the contractors, and we don't have a contractor yet, and some of this will 
for be subject to further discussions once we get contractors on board and they have they bring their expertise to this. But we, we believe, based on our experience, that giving them the entire site, both tracks, has a greater likelihood that they'll be able to compress this a bit. We talked about Montague being done three weeks earlier. We would certainly try to do whatever we could to advance this uh, sooner than the shorter than the 18 months. But right now we want to be, you know, realistic on what it would likely be. Uh, we preserve the connection between Bedford and the rest of Brooklyn, which is, is not insignificant to, to Williamsburg, attracting people from both directions. Uh, the downside, of course, there is one significant downside, which is fairly obvious, which is there's no service, rail service between Bedford and Manhattan and within Manhattan. So we would address that with uh, a number of, of of ways. First of all, our experience has been that the, the, if we can keep people on the subway, while it'll be a longer trip, it will still be the best possible alternative. It will be faster in, in higher capacity than uh, for most markets than most other alternatives. Um, the M line is a major alternative to this and we'll be adding significantly to M service, to J service, and to G service. Those are the major alternatives. We'll be looking to give people more options. So in some cases, we have stations close to each other without a free transfer, uh, one of them at, uh, between the J and the G at uh, Hughes, Lorimer, and uh, Broadway stations, and the other where the L is close to the three at Livonian um, Junius. Uh, so we would put in MetroCard transfers for this project. Um, we also would look to address the, the real area that's significantly impacted here, which is the, the Bedford to Manhattan market in two ways. One is working with the city. Both are involved working with the city in one case to supplement their enhanced ferry service that's going to be in place by this point with an additional route that they weren't planning to do, which is from North 6th Street in Williamsburg, which is an existing pier, to 20th Street in Manhattan, which is a new pier they're going to construct for an East River North-South service, but we would have a cross river service there. And the advantage of 20th Street underneath the FDR Drive there is that we have an existing bus service, the M23, which will by the end of this year be an SBS route. Uh, we have the M34A SBS, which comes close and we could extend to there. And we would overlay what, what I'm calling right now an M14 SBS. Uh, under either alternative, we need a significant bump up in, in 14th Street service over and above the existing M14 A and D. So an, M, an additional M14 that would run to this ferry that would uh, then go across town. Again, but all this would need significant coordination with the city in terms of traffic and, and prioritizing buses. We also show in this very generic dotted black line of some sort of Williamsburg, essentially an, a B39 SBS, which is a concept that's hard to to fathom given the ridership on the route now, but, but basically we imagine this as being a key additional route and in, in extended into Williamsburg to try to capture some of the market that uh, would be uh, otherwise left out without rail service. Um, the partial closure option, uh, so it, it, it takes, I described pretty much the characteristics, takes a bit longer has that break in service between uh, Bedford and Larimer. So it, it's sort of the reverse. The big pro is it does preserve the rail service uh, to Manhattan and at least a limited amount of rail service in Manhattan, although we do think when you're going down to 12 to 15 minute rail service and you have an existing three to five minute M14 bus service, people will very quickly shift to the bus and so we'll be adding more buses and so we end up with pretty much the same bus situation in Manhattan of needing a significant overlay bus service. Um, and the cons are that the shuttle train is very limited and um, the other big concern um, that we have with this is that it relies on maintaining service in that one tunnel and, and for the first 18 months it's a tunnel that's damaged as we saw in those photos. Uh, we're working in the adjacent tunnel very close to it and there's a risk that it could be further damaged. There's also, even, even if we don't end up with that risk, we, we need, have 
planned closures for maintenance where you would be shut down. But our big concern is an unplanned closure. It's much as bad as a full closure is, it's much better if we go into it in a planned way with building up our bus and rail service have on other routes and having those laid out than to have to scramble and try to come up with substitutes on a, a moment's notice. So the map looks similar. Um, because we would maintain the rail service from Bedford to Manhattan, we're not showing quite as many as the targeted uh, Williamsburg other routes because the rail service in that case would be the better alternative. Uh, but again, we're in the process of, of getting everybody's ideas on, on alternates in both of these. None of these are, are set in stone and we'll be continuing to work. As was mentioned before, the, these actual closures won't start till January of 2019. There's a lot of prep work before that that needs to happen. And uh, so we have some time to work out and work with the city on some of these mitigations as well. I mentioned before about the other subway routes. So the, the map on the right, it shows the outputs of our ridership model, which we ran without, uh, without an L train across the river to see where everybody would go. Uh, this doesn't include any of those mitigations we talked about. It's just basically a first shot model run. And what the thickness of the lines show is L riders where they would, you know, the alternates they would use. So it's not over and above the existing riders. This is just the L train market. So you can see that the M is, is a huge part of that equation. Uh, some riders spill over to the J because the M at some point runs out of capacity and we need to try to address that. The G, particularly northbound to uh, Long Island City, and then you see riders transferring into lines to Manhattan there, as well as uh, the AC in downtown Brooklyn. So we can add to the M, and we'll do that. The M will run 24-7 into Manhattan, at least as far as Rockefeller Center, and, and then we have to work out where it goes on the weekends. Um, the J, we will add what to whatever limits. At, at some point, the M then runs with the F, so we, we run out of capacity there, so we add Js. On the G, we're looking at um, full-length trains and more frequently, so it's about 160 percent additional capacity on the G that we can provide to really mitigate all the impacts on the G. And we can add a little on the A and C and would, would look to do that as well. And then a, a significant amount of bus service, certainly along 14th Street and hopefully as well across the Williamsburg Bridge. Now the next couple slides talk about the M, and I'm going to skip those because we have a whole big M presentation that we will show you, but I just want to get to the end of it before Lois takes, okay, the summary here. Actually, what the summary? The summary, I think, is hopefully we've made the case we need to, we need to do this. It's not something we can put off much longer, um, and we need to do it by closing the tunnel. We um, are repeatedly asked if we've made a decision about which alternative, and, and what the chairman says is we've committed to going out in, in May and June and, and presenting and listening to people about this, but shortly thereafter we need to make that decision because that's part of getting the contractor on board and working with them. But the, a lot of the details on the alternate services, as I said, we have some time to, to work through. So, Lois, do you want to talk, and I'll get the other presentation. Um, I just want, I, this was a lot of stuff. Would people want to ask questions about the L before we go I to the I would just M ask before? one question of fact, because mm. on the, the B model, the three-year model, mm. your strip map showed a different service on 14th Street than your, the last thing. It only showed stops at 1st Avenue, 6th Avenue, and 8th Avenue. And in, in, in the scenario, 3rd Avenue is not stopped. I understand that. But that first map showed no stop at Union Square. It just showed 6th no. Avenue and 8th Avenue after 1st Avenue. But the second oh, map so that you showed I mean, does show a stop at Union Square. It, 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 it's stopping at Union Square. We're skipping 3rd third, third Avenue, yes, and we'll just double check later. But let me. Um, we, the reason we're skipping, proposing to skip Third Avenue is it's a very relatively small station close to Union Square, and to minimize the, the length of time the train's in a single track, that would add basically another minute to at least just stopping there in both directions, and, and so reduce the amount of service yeah, we could yeah. run. Um, so do you want to take questions on this before you go to? What's the what's what's the group's preference? <laughs> um, Let's, let's take some questions before people forget their questions. Okay. Carol and then Stuart. Um, and then. So I, I was going to ask you, um, you 
said that the concrete is in relatively good condition when you go to take all this stuff out. Is that compromised it? And does that have to be rebuilt at the same time? Or? The, con the concrete liner of the tunnel is in relatively good shape. But will it be severely impacted as you take all the duct stuff out? No. No. The duct, the duct bank is actually built after that concrete liner was done. So it's just a matter of breaking that bond between, it's a 100-year-old concrete, but it's breaking that bond between that liner and the duct bank. And so the duct bank, which is concrete encased, clay ducts, gets demolished. What you saw in that photo was the demolition of the duct bank, not the liner. Stuart. Um, we certainly, we are looking at that. I don't have all all your questions on the top of my head and we can get back to you on. We, we are looking at by time of day. Um, we do know that particularly the, the, the greater Williamsburg market is, um, is as much off peak as it is peak. Uh, it's actually, I somewhat joke that the best time to do work there would be 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. probably. Um, they're not an early morning mark. In fact, the, the generally that the peak has been shifting later in the a.m. peak, um, but that's not necessarily true in the Manhattan cross town or further out in Brooklyn. So we need to make sure that we adequately handle, you know, all, all times of day and get people there. And we're certainly looking at this as a 24-hour issue. One of, the, one of the things we've been hearing when we go out there and we know we need to be sensitive to is that different parts of the Williamsburg community have different needs. So there's a big um, entertainment, tourist, bars, which, you know, are different than school kids trying to get to school. So I think we're operating on the assumption that our alternative services are going to have to extend over the 24 hours. Um, um, question on... Is there a difference in the cost between these two, and how is that being funded? The cost range for the project itself is in the 800 to a billion dollar range, right? So it depends on the degree of mitigations that we have to provide, and other what we're going to be asked to do. So the the bid value of the project itself is probably about half of that total co total, just on a ratio basis. Um, I don't think we'll know the difference between the costs until we understand all the different mitigations that are involved in either of those scenarios. But being a longer-term project, it certainly um, it escalates yeah. the cost. Most certainly there will be, there will be, I would say the longer shutdown will likely cost more, yes, so because of the construction duration and a lot of the things that, that go along with carrying a project for that time frame. And how is the funding coming on that? How is the, the funding, funding coming? The funding where, is, coming, the, where is the funding coming from? Okay, so we have a certain amount of funding that comes from the um, from the Sandy funds, recovery and re, and resiliency funds. We have a certain amount of funding that comes with what Peter mentioned is a core capacity improvement grant, which includes the additional substation work and the additional staircase and elevator at First Avenue and the additional staircases at. Um, at, at, at Bedford Avenue. Then there's the program, programmatic funding that comes with the, the fact that uh, Bedford Avenue is an ADA key station. Actually, it was, it was scheduled in this program to begin with. So when you take the three different pots of money, that, re that represents your funding. Right, but both, both, both those pots that John referred to, both the Sandy money and the core capacity money is federal money with a local match, correct? That's correct. And there's enough to regardless of which program we use. Uh, Chairman Prendergast has made it clear that the option we pick, that the, 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 the difference in cost is not going to drive the decision. Um, 
Uh, one thing I'm going to say is I know, Lois, you did say this at the L train in Williamsburg. Um, well, I'm sorry, Paragon State. It's, free, it's FEMA money. I know it goes into this L train project. Because uh, somebody, no, I think somebody, it's, it's, somebody it's, said it's, Sandy. It, it is Sandy money. It's, it's FTA money. It's, yeah. It's, uh. it's not, that's not FEMA. It's Federal Transit Administration money. Okay. Okay. Uh, main thing is I want to say is I do, I do applaud one thing that we're all focusing on is, yes, the 39 bus. I did put it in for the SBS because that 39 bus will take, because as you know, once the J, well, J train runs, goes into Manhattan, there is the only near accessible station on the J line is Fulton Street. But yes, the M has one at Broadway Lafayette and West 4th. But I'm glad there's other options. One thing I did ask uh, and I wrote it down. I did ask, is the 39 bus going to be going up to Loma Street to end there instead? Because I'm hearing two separate things that I'm a little confused, and some people in the community were confused. Is it a 39 bus or a shuttle bus will be operating? So, and, and the other one I just want to add, if you're going to end the M train, because I have been complaining about 57 and 6, where it ends when it blocks the F, you do have a relay track at Queens Plaza that cause, could help to get people two-way options go into Queen, uh, still connect from the E and the M or go to downtown Brooklyn. I'm very supported on this. I just want, I did put this in and I, I'm glad you did mention SBS 39 bus. I'm definitely happy on that. Okay, so, so just on the bus side of things, um, we have a lot of work to do and that's where we're going to take the next two years to figure it out. The, the, the thought is that um, for people around Bedford, who live closer to the ferry, the ferry option's better. Uh, for people who live a little closer to, absent to anything else, would take a bus or walk down to Marcy, or maybe Lorimer people who would walk down to uh, Hughes um, on the J and M, which will at that point be pretty crowded because a lot of people will be on those trains. If we can short circuit their trip so they don't have to walk down, they can get on a bus nearer to where they live and then get across in a very prioritized way across the bridge and connect with the subway in Manhattan, that would be uh, what we're trying to accomplish with that. As you probably know, the streets in Williamsburg are not real conducive to running buses, just traffic-wise and sidewalk space and all that. So we're definitely not looking to this to be coming right to the subway station. We don't want people taking the L train to Bedford to get on a bus over to Manhattan. That would be not the right approach here. Uh, we want L train riders to be who are on the in the subway system to stay on the subway system, and this this bus to take people uh, divert away from that subway system that are in closer in areas. And we have to work around where the construction the construction around the station itself at North Seventh is going to be challenged. So there's a lot of challenges we need need to work out. We need to work with the community and work with DOT on. Um, I just want to, um, Chris mentioned he gave us some comments. I want, we are on the website. There's a button that says L train reconstruction. We get, I know I get daily forwarding comments, recommendations that come in on that website. I want you to know a lot of people are spending serious time reading everything, reacting to it. So you might not have heard back from us on your comments, Chris, but it's, but it's all in the pile of stuff we're, we're keeping track of. And as we finish this listening tour, I think we're going to spend a lot of time reading through those suggestions which have merit, which have merit but are impossible to do, you know, which make us think of something else. So um, we you appreciate You already did on the record. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the 39 SBS. I did put that in, in my comment, and I, you did hear me. Okay. Um, one thing quick, just mention about the L train in Rockaway Parkway. Somebody's asking about a second train to run to ease pressure. There's going to be a lot of people asking that tonight. Uh, I'll talk to you privately. So by the J, you mean? By the, uh, yeah. I mean, by the... Right, and the problem with that, and we could talk offline, there's, there's a limited number of trains we can run, and we view the M as the one we need to, we can't be taking away from the M to, to, to give people that have other options. So we'll, we can talk offline what, about that. One of the things. And, and also well, separately about your, where, where the M goes. I mean, it's really a function of other work going on. It will clearly have to go north of Rock Center to somewhere to terminate that may be different on a weekend. Uh, 96 and 2nd is a possible option as well. So we'll see. In preparing for tonight's meeting out in Canorsi, one of the stats we developed is that 64% of the customers e southeast of Broadway Junction 
are not affected by this at all. I mean, marginally affected because the rush hour headways on the L will be slightly off. But for 64% of the people who board from Atlantic Avenue south to Rockaway Parkway, they're, they don't go through the tunnel. They're not affected. Well, let me, let me go backwards. I had two questions, but now that you mentioned 96th and 2nd, will this have, if you decide to use that, uh, will that have any impact on phase two of the Second Avenue subway building? And of course, that is supposed to go from 96th and 2nd with, with preliminary work starting like almost immediately. No, so, the, tu the tunnel goes to 105th Street and, and it's north of there. 96 is, it would be in service. Or, you know, this, it could go up Central Park West. There's a number of places the M can go. We have to work out okay. where it best fits in. That wasn't my question. I mean, but, but when I heard that, all the bells went off. Um, my question, which I have been asked by people all over the city, even people who don't live in Williamsburg or aren't affected or live on the Lower East Side, which is, uh, I guess it's a two-part thing. First is, why, why two and a half years, if there is such emergency going on right now, why, I know there has to be preliminary work and everything, but why that long a period of time? Maybe that's a good, maybe it's a good segue. One of the no, things. No, but then I have another question. Uh, but what I wanted to say to what you asked, Trudy, is um, we have not, I mean, early in the presentation, John said that the L was the most damaged of our tubes. Um, yeah. And as you know, we've done a couple of them up until now. We're working on some now. It was a very, very serious rigorous planning effort so that when we finally got into construction, when we were finally able to issue a contract, that, that we had all our ducks lined up, that we had explored every option for rebuilding it, and that we settled on what was the best option. We've also spent time and resources shoring up the tunnel. So, I mean, we are as confident as we can be have a timeline. Now, before we can do the L line, as Peter has said repeatedly, the M becomes a really, really big alternative to L, the L in Brooklyn. And before we do that, the M has its own issues. So I think this is a good segue to go into it. Well, let me, well, it's not my meeting. So let, me, let me just ask quickly, and I don't want to sound like Debbie Downer. No, but can I ask one more? I should have maybe asked this first. Which is, in this time of climate change, of strange weather patterns, of things happening that nobody has, have you taken into consideration various exigencies about something happening again with a tornado or a flood or whatever. The quick answer is yes, and John, you want to elaborate a little about the resiliency? Yes, we're incorporating every conceivable protective measure that we can to make sure this tunnel doesn't flood again. The, the Canarsie tube has flooded three times in 20 years, and now we're going to make sure that it's rebuilt and that what gets rebuilt cannot be damaged by flooding again. I didn't mean that. I meant between now and January of 2019. Yes, understood. That something I, I, may, and have you been in touch with long-term weather forecasters and all of that to <coughs> where it's possible? We, none of us have crystal balls that we can see into the future, but where it is possible, if you could go over what measures have been taken, I appreciate it. If, if I could go over those measures after we go through the next presentation? Okay, fine. If we have the time, and if not, probably another time we can go through that. But there's a there's significant amount of work that we've been we've been doing. Just to look outside. If you look at Bowling Green, as you came into the station, we're putting in a sub. What, what kind of doors are we putting in there, John? We're at, like as an example, what Lois was pointing to is that the Bowling main Bowling Green entrance, the the granite surround of that main entrance is being hardened in order to accept flood flood logs in advance of a storm. If you were to go down to the staircase at the north end of Whitehall Street Station on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the easterly side of the street, you'll see behind a screened door, we have installed a, a submarine door, a door that can close off and basically seal off the station. On the opposite side of the street, up against the courthouse, or up against uh, what is now, I guess, the uh, bankruptcy court, you'll see that we have, we're, we're installing also a, a, uh, a protective measure to close off that, that end. So all the flood vulnerable points in lower Manhattan, as well as all the flood vulnerable, po flood vulnerable points for the under river tubes are being hardened as we speak.
The substations will be built. Some of them will be awarded for contract prior to this work being completed. The intent is for them all to be ready by the time this project is finished. No, that's the whole. That's one of the whole points of this approach is to, that we're doing the ADA, the staircase work, the substation work at Avenue B, the uh, the under the repairs to the under river tubes, the hardening of the vent shafts, the Bedford Avenue ADA and staircase work. Um, we're doing all of that work within the same envelope of time of this project. I mean, we, again, we'll work that out. We, we obviously have a lot of bus service that goes into the Lower East Side that we wouldn't want to negatively impact, but, all right. We're basically a track capacity on those. Well, I mostly at track capacity, there will be additional M service on the entire length of the M. So uh, through the 53rd Street Tunnel, there will be some additional trains, certainly in the off-peak, um, but also in the, in where we can in the peak. Um, that's one of the challenges here. There's a lot of challenges in, in accommodating these riders on a lot of routes that don't have huge amounts of additional capacity. They have some, and we have to make sure we distribute that. Uh, some of the transfers and other station points are going to be things that we're going to have to work on and are taking a look at. One thing we didn't mention, uh, yet another part of this project is we will be adding stair capacity at the Court Square station to accommodate the additional riders getting off the G. Um, and so there's there's some work we're already building into this and we're still surveying other areas we may need to make some investments. And hopefully the seven train work will be done by then, so uh, that won't be <laughs> let's, let's get to the good work by then. Okay. So, why don't you go, yeah. So, um, folks are, I, I think, familiar a little, little bit about where the Bushwick Viaduct is, but just in the event that... In the event that I can figure out how to it. It's in Bushwick. <laughs> we know where it is. between the Central Avenue Station and Myrtle Broadway. All right, so, so if, we, if we look at that, uh, the, the box in the middle of the photograph there, uh, I'm sorry, in the middle of the slide there, you'll start to see... Um, where the viaduct location is. It's actually where the Myrtle Avenue line cuts into the Jamaica line. So it's referred to as the Bushwick Viaduct, the Bushwick Cut, the Myrtle Viaduct, et cetera. We have a number of different names, but it's the same same location. I don't want to and just, just like the other one, just to sell, this, in this case, there's 60,000 people along that branch. 50,000 of those go along the cut. The rest are transferring to the L train. Um, and there's... We'll talk about the service a little more about uh, the 14,000 at the south end. You saw this slide before uh, in the Canarsie presentation, just basically showing on the the M on the Bushwick side why this is one of the key things that we need to have running 24/7 and can't have any interruptions uh, when Canarsie's out. And likewise, when we're working on on the M train, uh, one of the big alternates is the L. So we need to 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 have these in sync with each other. Right. And that doesn't look so good. So, right, so while it's coming up, or if it doesn't come up, it was, it's, uh, this basically is what's going to happen should we not rebuild the viaduct, which is we won't have the structure there. But Let me just, I don't know why this is getting weird. So I'm going to just close everything out and then try to reopen. So uh, while, we, while Peter's doing that, I'm going to try to talk because I know we're all pressed for time. But it was, uh, it's a concrete section of the line, elevated concrete section, that was built in the uh, 1913 to 1914 time frame. Oh, okay. um, yeah, now, all right. Now, now it, was, it wasn't opening right. Okay, now I got it, I think. There we go. So oh. you get to see in the lower left-hand photo the fact that this cut section of railroad cuts right between a couple of different, uh, 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 the pro those properties there. The uh, It's a two- it's a deck, concrete deck that supports both tracks, and it has ex, ex, extraordinary deterioration to it. The overall length of this is about 300, 310 feet of structure. Um, and as you can see, rebuilding that section, where, which basically is where the, word, the lettering Bushwick Viaduct is, 
So it, it, that stretch of, of track um, represents significant constructability issues with regards to the adjacent real estate. The photo on the right is how they built it back 100 plus years ago. So the they houses did. were there before the structure. The houses were there. And you can see that they, they, you know, you can see how close they are to these houses just with the construction techniques that they had then. There's actually one house has its kitchen right under this structure. Oh. And the, the kitchen predates the structure. Yeah, right it's... over the kitchen. <laughs> Bizarre. <laughs> so, so we're going we're gonna to use it. That's selling it, Andrew. <laughs> I was going to say add my own ad lib, but yeah. I'm going to decide against <laughs> it. So here it is, a different uh, representation of the same thing where you, where you see the, in the middle of the photo, uh, the slide, the letter M. That's where we're cutting across, and it, and it ties into the Jamaica line. So, so what, we've, what, we've asse what we've assessed in this uh, project is the... Here's just some of the historic right. conditions. Again, this is just to kind of show what they went through 100 years ago to build this. Um, um, these, are, these are actual pro job progress photos properly taken and filed 100 plus years ago. I'm very, and you can very, see the, the kitchen on the right there sticking out, actually. Actually, in the upper, he's right, in the upper right-hand photo, you'll see, you'll see the fact that uh, there's a stack on that kitchen. There's a, they properly vented it and everything. So. Um, Who owns that kitchen? That, the person cool. who lives at 19 Dittmars, what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to really just quickly talk. You have the, the concrete deck is, is deteriorating. A lot of it is falling off. You can start to, it's a ballasted track. It relied on the shoulder of the structure to hold the track geometry in place. That has deteriorated. The ballast is falling into the property below, onto the yards of the backyards of these folks. And um, the overall support, the concrete piers that are supporting this, this is now the lower left-hand photo, have deteriorated. The, 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 seat, the seating has deteriorated. We've had to go in and temporarily shore up the girders. And we're at, a, we're at a point of age and deterioration of this structure that we have to go in and do a full replacement of that structure. In addition to the Bushwood Viaduct out at the other end of the line um, is the, a br the Transit Authority M-Line bridge that spans over the New York and Atlantic Railroad. That bridge has been hit several times by freight trains passing underneath. It is no longer repairable. And while we have the outage necessary to replace this viaduct, we are going to be replacing this bridge as well. That bridge only needs a couple of month closure as compared to the viaduct needs. So this is just an aerial view of that. So the intent is for us to award a project by the end of this year for us to mobilize an outage that starts in uh, June, July of 2017, that the Atlantic, New York and Atlantic Bridge be done during that two month summer period, July, August of 17, and be back in place by by, uh, by, by the end of the summer of 17. The other part of the viaduct is a, is a longer 10-month closure. Um, that, that will, that will uh, t again, start in July of 17 and ed end towards the uh, late spring of 18. The, the urgency on doing yeah. the, 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 the bridge at the northern end of the route is um, it's right next to Christ the King High right, School. Which we can see, yeah. see in this photo here, that's the, uh, the building on the upper right, the tan building. On the upper left is uh, is a shopping mall. I think over time railroads have gotten higher, and I think they're they're going to be doing some work to. We're taking the care of the, the, the issue that caused yeah. the hitting yeah. of the freight train. So from a from a project phasing point of view, as John mentioned. Uh, either one of these would cause us to really not be able to run M service because the only place we could turn trains around is at the far north end of the line. Uh, so it makes sense to combine the two. Um, in this case, because it's a more open air, even though we end up with the larger project slicing the line, disconnecting the line from the rest of the system, we're actually going to construct some inspection facilities at Fresh Pond Yard so we can run rail service 
except for that two month period where we have the uh, have the full closure have the bridge closed on the north end as well so during the summer of 17 the line will be closed it's entirely in entirety and I'll show you some of the the bus service in, in another slide of how we handle that uh, and then when we go into the eight months or so the remainder of the the southern end of the project will run a rail shuttle from Met Middle Village Metropolitan down to Myrtle Wyckoff to transfer the L and have a, a shuttle bus on the southern end continuing correct yes correct. and I want to just point out that Myrtle Avenue Myrtle what we call Myrtle Broadway will have train service throughout Central and Knickerbocker however will be at, without train service for the 10 months of the project right so this this is essentially what we just talked about in terms of the uh, the rail side of things so the M at the start of this project will the main line M will still run from Queens into Manhattan from Forest Hills to Manhattan and back out to Williamsburg but we'll go to Broadway Junction and then when we can restore the, the sh M shuttle we will do that we will in, we can't increase cannot increase L service in the peak because we won't have done the the substation work yet but we will increase it in the shoulders because we'll have some additional ridership and on the bus um, we're calling bus route number one runs for the duration of the project that's the one that goes from Myrtle to Myrtle Myrtle uh, Wyckoff to Broadway uh, supplementing the b54 route uh, the northern part we need to have buses during the summer and that's a little tricky because the streets are narrow windy and actually disconnected north of Fresh Pond from Metropolitan Avenue and you probably read in the paper there's also a, a city street br bridges that cross the New York and Atlantic have similar problems and they're doing work and we're coordinating with them to be able to get the buses through all that uh, so we have what we show is bus route 2 which is primarily designed to serve Fresh Pond Forest and Seneca and then a supplemental route uh, to more quickly get the number the larger number of riders up at the terminal station down to the L and the M uh, as well as some existing bus routes in the area that people can use as well um, <laughs> yeah I'm sorry I think we said is 50,000 during the day going through the uh, Bushwick uh, 60,000 total so it's a much smaller number but it's it's still not insignificant and if it wasn't for the L this would be the big project we're talking about it, it it's fairly disruptive to the to those riders and uh, one of the other things I just to, to make clear one of the things we're doing over the next two years is building up both the rail car fleet and the bus fleet this will be a significant additional need additional service on both and we need to work out at those logistics as well so there's a lot of things that we need to do in prep work uh, both of these contracts will be awarded late this year so both of them even though the actual big work on the Canarsie doesn't start till 19 a lot of work will be happening beforehand so and, and necessary work so it's not really delaying stuff it all kind of fits that we that this work prep work fits well other prep work is happening and then we start in 19. We're not going to have a traditional contract, uh, Andrew. We're going to have an RFP. We're going to, we're going to have a, uh, um, a select group of contractors for this. That's a process that will kick off, actually, um, probably be advertised shortly. <clears throat> what we're looking for is a teaming arrangement of some of the best contractors to tackle that work, the Canarsie work. Um, they're going to be given the technical requirements of the job without being shared the outage plans because we have not made that determination they can start to figure out how to approach this work regardless as to the shutdown strategy um, based on the technical requirements of the job and then once we've determined after all of the outreach once we've determined the outage strategy they will then be told what that is and they'll be able to come in with us with some of the best proposals to do that either uh, on how they would how they would execute that work depending on what the strategy would be oh. 
So, so uh, great question. And in, uh, what we did is we looked at the Montague work that we did and the magnitude of the work here, and I'm talking just the magnitude in the under river part or the tunnel part, the part that requires closure, was approximately 30% greater than what we did in Montague. So if you take that 14 months and just it, just figure it out, you're, you're in. So that allowed us a very, very significant, you know, it's a simple comparison. It was a very good contractor. Their approach was very aggressive. They worked at 24 seven. And um, so that's the kind of contractor that we're gonna get. Now post that project, we did have a negotiated incent incentive. So what, as we go about Canarsie, we're currently evaluating, okay, how we're gonna select the contractor, what is gonna be the selection criteria. It can, it can include t a time requirement. In other words, it could be a cost and a time. In other words, so that's all under discussion right now. And, but even with that, even after say we do a cost plus t uh, a best schedule uh, procurement, the possibility still does exist to offer incentives after award. Uh, following up on Andrew's question, uh, how are you going to determine, you said you're going to do to a select group of, of contractors. Who is going to determine who the RFPs go to? Uh, New York City Transit's procurement department. Uh, there's, there's, there's only a, a uh, there's probably only four to five contractors in New York City that would go after this work. Um, so we expect that there'll be some teaming among those contractors um, in order to go after it. It's a significant project. It, I'm not, there's not significant risk in the project, but there's significant contractors risk in the project. And I think we, we're pretty sure on the contractors that will express an interest in this, but New York City Transit Procurement will reach out to those contractors and also the industry to see who would have the best, who who's gonna be interested in it and who will be, who'll be uh, teaming up and uh, receiving the packages. Well, will the contractor on the Montague have an, a better position? You just said that you were, you were hap happy, you were pleased with, with the Montague project. So does it make sense maybe to? The, yeah. con the contractor on Montague will be one of the contractors. The one thing is, is that they may understand the work better. That, work, that will work to their advantage in understanding it, but it can also work to their disadvantage because now that they understand they it, it. They, they may, they they may, may not they, want to do it. Or their pricing could be higher. So, so uh, you know, for lack, for, 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 for not me sharing anything more than that, I, 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 think, I think that they will be in play. They'll be one of the players. I, I would say that that's absolutely part of the criteria, so. We have time for one more. Edith had her hand up. The one thing, Edith, we did not mention in this presentation, not, not for any reason, just no, 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 uh, we are, part of the Bushwick job requires the temporary relocation of certain classes of people, if you will. I mean, can we get the map up here of the, the, the property? So there are seven houses on Dittmore Street. One of them includes the condition under the track. We are in conversation with the owners and tenants in those houses about temporarily relocating them for the 10 months we need to do the project, New York City Transit. Will, will, will pay all their relocation call. I mean, it's a whole big program, pretty similar to what we did on 2nd Avenue. Yeah. So those are, those are seven houses, and I think we think they're, so there's seven owners, and there's something like 12 or 13 tenants in the seven houses. If we go around, you see where it says Broadway Jay-Z, that's an empty lot. We're talking to the owner about that lot, about renting it for the cost of our job. If you look at the top of where it says Dittmore Street, you see some cars parked. That's another empty lot that would help us a great deal with um, access to the site and moving things out. We're talking to the guy who owns that lot as well about renting it. And then on 
the, the, you see a bunch of houses on the left of where it says Bushwick Viaduct. Those are two buildings. One of them has two commercial units and the other one, and three or four tenants, and the other one I think is five tenants. We're talking to landlords, we're talking to tenants. Those people we think are gonna have to leave for about three months. So we have a, a we've hired the same relocation consultant we used on Second Avenue, RC Cullen. Um, we have made contact with the owners and the tenants. We are working individually because this is very retail. Our goal is, first off, I'm saying it because we all mean it. It is our goal to restore everybody to their abodes. Um, that's where we want to end up. We are talking to everybody. We're trying to work out the best possible deal for each person. Um, so it's a work in progress, um, but that's what's happening with that. I, I would hope that you learn from some of the mistakes in term, on Second Avenue in terms of relocating people and, and dealing with them before the fact rather than, than after the fact. I mean, it's not similar in terms of the number of, of stores and, and it's a much It's a better, much smaller relocation, but, but it's, in a, it's a different kind of community. It's a community under gentrification stress. Um, so we are very, very sensitive to both people's perceptions of what's going on and the reality. Okay, so we, but, we look but, forward. No, but what I'm saying is those, I hope you have learned from, in, in any project of this kind, in relocating, that you've learned from some of the initial mistakes that were made. On I, I believe Avenue. we have. We'll be yes. good. Okay. Thank you. These folks have to leave. So, Ellen, last. Boston. Oh, I don't remember so what. I'm trying to remember right now. We're, we're in the we're in the 50 to 100. You know, we're also in the procurement stage right now, so I don't I don't want to. Uh, but it's in the 50 to 100 range. So. important presentation. These are very tough projects, very tough decisions. Um, I guess the L train will be a combination of operational and political decisions in, in the long run. Um, we wish you all the best and we'll be following this. Comments, Good luck tonight in Canarsie. Right, right, yeah. right, we'll, uh, we'll all go to the website and give you our opinions. All right. Um, can we get an approval of the minutes that were um, sent around? You have a comment or an approval? Okay, great. Any objections? Second. Okay, let's go into the chair's report. Um, for those who were not able to join us at the last TRC meeting, we had a bit of a surprise as our vice chair and Queensborough president, Representative Mike Sinansky, announced his retirement from the council. Mike had served for 25 years on the council and said at the last meeting he, uh, th that the quarter century mark was the right time to make a change. Uh, Mike has tendered his resignation to the governor. The Queensborough President's Office has consulted with our staff on the process of recommending a successor and is at work to find a new representative. We as a council will also have to elect a new vice chair and we can discuss our options regarding this post under new business. We will all miss Mike and his contributions to the TRC and have prepared a resolution of appreciation that we can also consider under new business. And he did say he'd stop by occasionally. Um, the MTA, as you previously heard, conducted two public meetings on options for the reconstruction of the Canarsie tube on May 5 and May 12. Chris Greif and Bill Henderson attended the May 5 session in Brooklyn, while Carol and myself attended the session in Manhattan on May 12th. We've just heard the details of options that were presented, but the reaction of riders who attended was another interesting part of the meetings. For the most part, riders appeared to understand the seriousness of the situation. Actually, there were some pieces of, uh, of decrepit materials from the tunnels at these meetings so that you could handle them and, and inspect them, and that was quite an eye-opener. Um, and um, Riders ha um, had alternatives that would allow them to reach the destinations, and I maintain that the success of either of these options will be on the alternatives presented to riders. Uh, on May 6th, Bill Henderson and Ellen attended the Regional Plan Association's assembly, which featured several presentations aimed at reorganizing the area's mass transit system to make it work more efficiently. In one morning session, panelists discussed new models for governing the existing transit network, which could result in both operation of individual parts of the network by separate, possibly private sector 
uh, entities and greater regional coordination of the separate pieces. While there have been some success stories, such as Transport for London, the recent difficulties that Washington, D.C.'s metro has faced make it clear that regional governance is not a cure-all, and WMATA has some real problems. We're certainly in favor of making different operating agencies work together more effectively, and the TRC is making our own contribution to this effort with our Freedom Ticket proposal. Freedom Ticket is receiving growing support and more serious consideration as we move toward expected hearings on changes to MTA's fares and tolls this fall. We recently learned the MTA is having a market research firm conduct a survey of preferences for different trips involving commuter rail, subways, and buses, assuming different price levels. We're also getting strong interest in Freedom Ticket from New York City government on both the administration and city council sides. We heard some of the support at a New York City Council legislative budget hearing held on May 17. Carol and Bill Henderson attended this meeting at which uh, New York City DOT and MTA officials discussed their plans with the committees on finance and transportation. The freedom ticket concept was raised several times in the discussion with New York City Transportation Commissioner and MTA board member Polly Trottenberg stating the administration is very interested in pursuing plans to reduce the cost of commuter rail travel within the city to improve its residents' transportation options. In addition, during the New York City transit portion of the meeting, council member Danique Miller expressed his support for reduced fares for commuter rail trips in the city at length. The hearing was also interesting as it featured a strong difference of opinion on the value of reinstituting F Express service in Brooklyn. Council member David Greenfield, whose district would be benefited by the service change, praised the reestablishment of F Express service, while council member Brad Lander, whose district would receive less service as a result of reestablishing F Express, condemned the change. And we can discuss that under business too. New York City Transit released a feasibility study on the change, and it's important to note that this is only a study. Remember, this is only a study. Um, with recommendations and not, as Council Member Greenfield seemed to imply, a fait accompli. And, and count, as I recall, Council Member Greenfield said this was starting this, this late summer, and of course it is not. Um, the study found that it is possible to run two way express service on the F between Church Avenue and J Street Metrotech with no net additional service, meaning that local stations in this segment would see their service cut by one half. If express services implemented, AM peak express riders would save an average 3.4 minutes, and local riders would lose an average 1.3 minutes with a net travel time of 27,000 minutes. Who figured that out? Jesus. Uh, I think, I think that uh, the, chairman me the chairman mentioned at, when he was questioned at yesterday's press conference, this is the case where 49% would benefit and 51% might, might not. Uh, it's, that, it's that close. However, the most time any northbound rider would save is 7.3 minutes. That's in a perfect world, of course. Overall, slightly more riders would lose time than gain time, but this is nearly an even split. Given the potential time savings, the study recommends that express service be implemented. I have concerns about this and would rather see express service implemented south of Church Avenue when the completion of construction permits it, as this would also reduce travel times for riders going to South Brooklyn while impacting far fewer local stop uh, users, both now and in the future. New York City Transit is committed to a public dialogue on this issue, and we should be part of it. I would also add that Brooklyn has changed substantially since the initial uh, proposal for F train service, and that there are rapidly developing communities and important places that would be bypassed with the current F Express recommendation. On May 2nd, Bill Henderson, Ellen Shannon, and I met with Assembly Member Jim Brennan to review the status of legislative issues important to riders. We discussed the Move New York plan, Freedom Ticket, and the possibility of gaining voting power for rider representatives on the MTA board. The Assemblyman suggested several other legislators to whom we should reach out, and we are in the process of setting up similar meetings with the, after the current session winds down. Also, if you didn't see the news release or press coverage of the change, the Day Street Concourse at Fulton Center will open at 5 p.m. today. Um, an odd time to open it, but it's happening today at 5 p.m. This will allow riders to this will allow riders to allow riders. This doesn't read well, but anyway, this will allow riders to connect between the Fulton Center and the Port Authority's World Trade Center transportation hub, the Calatrava Terminal, for those in the know, Battery Park City, and World Trade Tower. One and four, all without coming outside and being subjected to weather. 
This, of, this is of particular note as it will create an ADA accessible transfer between subway lines serving Fulton Center and PATH trains. The Day Street Concourse contains several multimedia screens, which the Transit, Rider, Transit Riders Council heard about several years ago from MTA uh, Director of Real Estate Jeff Rosen to, bribe, to provide information, advertising, and digital artwork to the corridor's users. As is our practice for our August TRC meeting, we are planning to make this year's meeting a field trip. We've gained a lot of insight from prior field trips, and I believe seeing a facility in person while having the benefit of experts from New York City Transit assists us to understand the system. I have a suggestion for this year's, this August's outing, and we can discuss this and other possibilities under new business. Wow, there's a lot under new business today. Please mark your calendars for our PCAC meeting on June 2nd. New York City Transit President Ronnie Hakem will be the guest speaker and will discuss the state of the transit system and its relation to other transit providers, including the MTA's rail agencies. Um, let me go into the board report um, quickly because there's a lot of interesting things. Um, obviously, everybody knows this by now, but the MTA has a capital program. It is the largest in the history of the MTA. It is also the latest in the history of the MTA, but at least we can now start to do um, RFPs, as you heard some of the things today, and, um, and procurements to allow expansion and really important changes to the system, including new fare payment. The MetroCard is seriously wearing out, as you saw from people swiping continuously to try to get into the system. Um, it also is um, slowing th throughput. Um, there are a lot of stations that need work. Um, there are lots of new cars on order. Unfortunately, R179 continues to be late to replace the 32s and 42s. Uh, there are uh, cars for the commuter rails that are going to be on order, um, more ADA accessible stations. I mean, there's just so much in this capital program. It is wonderful that it's finally moving and phase, ahead. And phase two of and the Second yes, Avenue there's, subway, there's which was really the holdup. That's a big piece of phase two. Um, as far as the um, discussion of F Express service, let's leave that for new business. Let's not do that twice. Um, also, um, there is progress on phase one of Second Avenue. Some of the escalator and elevator problems at 72nd Street appear to have been resolved. Um, there is power to a lot of it. Um, it looks like it's a go for December, uh, barring some unforeseen thing, probably a, a Christmas present for all New Yorkers. You may have, you may have seen um, in today's papers there is discussion of the initial headways that will be on the, um, the Q line for southbound uh, rush hours in the AM peak. Um, I don't believe that an eight-minute headway is enough. I think this is going to be so successful that people are going to be very surprised. I think this is going to really change people's travel patterns, particularly those who now take crosstown buses to the B and the C line on Central Park West with the uh, Q, you will be able to have a one-seat ride to the west side, and I think it's going to really be much more popular than anyone anticipates. Yesterday at the press conference, the chairman indicated if that is the case and there are much more riders than is anticipated, they are prepared to uh, increase the service frequency to accommodate those riders. On the other hand, of course, hypothetically, do you need a four- or five-minute headway to serve outbound riders at Neck Road and Sheepshead Bay. I mean, so there may have to be a short turn of, of somewhere um, for, for Q service, but that's all in the future. At least it's moving forward, and that's great. You wanted to add something about yes. Second Avenue? Yes. Uh, con uh, Congresswoman Maloney last week had a press conference in which I participated. There was a lot of media coverage, and just gave every, every time she does it, she gives a report card, and she gave based on a lot of conversations and having gone down into the tunnel again. By the way, I would suggest that maybe we want to set up another tour for us sometime before December, because the work that's yeah, been done is, is amazing. But anyway, she gave it an A-, minus, and based on the idea that it would be open December of this year. 
And then the question was asked, and what happens if not? And she said, then it goes to an F. So, uh, but there are problems. It was brought out that as far as the testing goes, uh, which is now going to be compressed into a much more shorter period of time, but we were reassured by the uh, uh, Joe and, and the other, I can't remember his last name now, but it was community outreach people, that, that, that safety would still be the first consideration. But uh, I just want you to know that, that there was an A minus. That's great. You got to hold <laughs> a little bit back. And at the Lexington 63rd Street station, there will be an across the platform transfer to F service from Q e service. E exactly. Yeah. And the long talked about Third Avenue entrance yes. to at 63rd Street, which I can see I've them talked about it. for a long time. That is that will be opened, and that may be even opened a little earlier. It may be opened in as yep. early as November yep. in order with, to coordinate with the F line. Yep. So, this is this is great. Um, and as everybody knows, the W uh, will be coming back in November. Um, when that happens, Q service will will start at 57th and 7th to allow them to finish work on Second Avenue. And then uh, when that um, goes to 96th and 2nd in hopefully in December. Uh, we will have um, the old pattern of N and Q express service along Broadway and R and W local service along Broadway. Um, so that's that's really wonderful news. Um, I would also mention that. Did you want to ask something? Sure. No, no, there's, there's no way you could not have two services on the Astoria branch. And, and it was a natural to bring the W back. There were some, actually some suggestions at the public hearing, some a little odd suggestions about routing the R to Astoria and uh, with no mention of what would serve Queens Boulevard. But no, this is the right thing to do. Yeah, now. I don't know that the, I don't know that that service plan is 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 set yet. I'm not sure there'll be less. Yeah, it's not going to be every six minutes to 96th and second. Interestingly, um, in the southbound, uh, but we, we will we will certainly watch that. Um, huh. Yeah. Because I'm on the I'm on the queue on the on the Brighton line, and no, you're not e just sitting right here. As I was saying it again, oh. uh, the Q, the queue train during the morning rush. Remember, we don't have just have a story of queue. We have some go to 57th as well, and then you know sometimes if I see one queue already at Kings Highway, one is starting to come from Sheepset Bay. So, I was when you said eight minutes, I was like, wait a minute, they're decreasing the queue? Because I'm like, I thought it interestingly. Was in one of the rush hours, it's six minutes. In the other rush hour, it's eight minutes. Which one is which in the, now? In the AM, I think it's it's eight, and I think in the PM, it's six. It's, Ouch. It's, yeah, I, at least that's the way it was presented to me. There is a there is a book that you can look at for the service plan. I did I did look, and it was six minutes both morning and that evening. That is not what the uh, Dan Rivoli of the Daily News has said. But well, someone needs to get. Let me also just state, and this is. I mean, this is both good and bad news. The work is going ahead on the Jamaica reconfiguration plan for east side access. Um, it's good that Jamaica is going to get some capacity increases. What's not so good is Platform F is going ahead. I mentioned this to both the, the president of the Long Island Railroad, to the chairman, and to Mitch Pally from the Long Island Railroad Committee on the board. If you are somebody who has formerly had a one-seat ride to Brooklyn from Long Island, or at worst, an across-the-platform transfer to Brooklyn, you're going to lose both of those things. You will have to go up over to Platform F. Now, if you're seated on a Long Island Railroad train, would you opt for a three-seat ride to your destination to Lower Manhattan or a two-seat ride? I think this is going to impact the Lexington Line and the 7th Avenue uh, IRT because once you're seated, 
you're going to stay to the Manhattan terminal that your train is going and then switch to a subway rather than switch at Jamaica and switch again at Atlantic Barclays. And I think they understand that and, you know, I think you're going to see less use of the Brooklyn branch as a result of this Jamaica reconfiguration plan, which sort of is great for freedom ticket but not so great for commuters from Long Island or those going to lower Manhattan. Andrew? Yes. Uh, you just mentioned east side access. Yeah. What is the newest? 2022. January or December? I mean, early 22? Can't or say. Sometime. Deborah, do you in? recall? Um, <laughs> okay, I, I don't know that. I mean, it's it's going to be very. Long time. Long time. Yes. <laughs> let, let me just move on because we have a lot to talk about. Um, you've probably seen a lot of press coverage over Long Island Railroad mainline third track, which would be between Floral Park and Hicksville stations. Apparently, the mayors of both New Hyde Park and Floral Park and maybe Carl Place are opposed to this. I don't know if this is because um, it doesn't take additional property. It's all being done in the existing right of way, but I guess some residents who live along the tracks don't want extra train service and the noise that that brings with them. This would also, by the way, remove some of the most dangerous grade crossings along the Long Island Railroad mainline, um, which is a great thing for those villages, but there is a lot of talk of, of a possible lawsuit to stop this. The governor, of course, is very pro mainline third track. This would allow much better reverse peak commuting options for, for folks along the way. Of course, more rail service increases property values, and, and I'm told, unless you live right along the tracks and then it decreases them. but. Um, so that's going to be a, a battle that's going on. But um, between Farmingdale and Ronkonkoma, second track is definitely a go as a result of this capital program, and that's very good news uh, for Ronkonkoma branch users. And finally, um, since you know Metro North just can't seem to catch a break, uh, between the gas explosion last year, the fire in that uh, uh, a few weeks ago or a week ago, whenever it was, un under under their elevated structure on Park Avenue and people going onto their tracks um, in uh, Valhalla, they just can't catch a break. So um, a lot was made of this at the board meeting and apparently there will be uh, increased and added inspections of all facilities to see if there's propane stored or, or anything else dangerous that might be under both New York City Transit's elevated structures and uh, the commuter rail's elevated structures. I don't know. This, the, the, uh, the storage of this propane at this garden center was not even approved by anybody. They just had it. Yeah. Good question. That question was asked at the board meeting. <sighs> Actually, somebody asked, are there any restaurants under New York City transit elevator structures? And I, I'm thinking to myself, can you just name them all under Roosevelt Avenue alone? Yeah. Just right, right, right under the seven line by itself, not to mention Broadway in, in, in Kingsbridge Heights and Riverdale and along Broadway in, in, in Brooklyn. I mean, restaurants, of course there's restaurants. So, they are looking into that very question now to see. If you have a license to use propane, I would think a periodic inspection of how you're storing it would be in order. MTA's property. Well, that's not MTA property that's under, under you know, along Park Avenue in Harlem, for instance. It's not MTA's property. Economic, Economic Development Corporation of the city of New York. Or privately owned. Yeah. That, that particular property. It's a city street, sure. Absolutely. No, it's it's it. Park Avenue is a city street there, sure. No, it's 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 property that's owned by the owned by the city of New York, and it's administered by the Economic Development Corporation. You don't mean the entire length of no, the not the entire, no. but the but the under the, the under the the stuff that's under the under the elevated structure, out out in in Harlem, is even at 128th to 130th. I think it is. I think it is. I under the it is. Uh, I it is. the media, took that issue that we had, let's say with. Uh, with the safety issue and turned it into a security issue. Yes. And Cheryl Kennedy made some comments that I don't believe she should have, uh, uh, you know, 
concerning the lack of attention to these things. You know, uh, security schedules are not public, right. but she right. commented that actually there was no attention whatsoever. So that's something I think this uh, body should be I pursuing think it's on everybody's letter, radar now. You know, um, yeah. and not just dismissing that it's the city of New York. Sure, because um, I believe some one newspaper had, what if there was a car with a bomb in it under one of these trucks? Sort of, of course. Yeah. I don't know how you inspect every car that's parked, but... Uh, well, you could eliminate parking under certain viaducts at certain hours of the day. That'll go over real well with well, uh, merchants, I'm sure, but it's a possibility. No, certain, you know. Okay, so we have a, a host of things to discuss. Um, um, I think for purposes of what we've seen today and what I know is going to be happening next year, that um, it would behoove us on our August field trip to take a look at the Bushwick Viaduct um, at Myrtle and Broadway, uh, between Myrtle and, and Central Avenue, and go up to uh, Metropolitan Avenue, and then we could have uh, there's a host of restaurants we could eat at Fresh Pond Road area, so I think that would be a very interesting trip for us. I believe it is, uh, but I will find out. Um, certainly, uh, inspecting the viaduct and looking at at under the uh, between um, um, Myrtle and Broadway and Central Avenue is accessible. Absolutely. Yes, I do. We're looking into that, Edith. Uh, Andrew, yes. Metropolitan is accessible. It's on. It's like right even street. But Myrtle Broadway, I've never seen an elevator there. We're not going to go up on the platform. We're going to look at what's under it. Oh. Street inspection. Street inspection. Well, I hope yeah. you get a special bus for us that day. Well, the bus along Broadway is accessible. Yes, yes, it is. All right. So, um, as far as the issue of F Express service. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think Brooklyn has changed greatly since the days of the original F Express service. Um, I don't believe you can bypass Carroll Street, Smith 9th Street, 4th Avenue 9th Street, 15th Street, Prospect Park, and Fort Hamilton Parkway in today's Brooklyn. I think that cutting those folks' service in half would be a huge mistake. Um, I think if you, if you have the service express south of Church Avenue, just stopping at 18th Avenue, Kings Highway, and then all the stops to Coney Island, folks there would see a time-saving. Um, the most uh, fastest-growing parts of Brooklyn would not be impacted. And as a matter of fact, there is a GO coming in June, uh, President Hakem said, which will do a lot of this kind of thing. The GO is actually south of Church Avenue and will use the F Express tracks. And we'll get an idea of how that works. Um, uh, Deborah, do you have any more info on that, on that, when that might start? And uh, I, I know it's for Culver Line work, but June, I heard. Yeah. The, the signs are up. The signs are up already? Um, okay. Because they're continuing the replacement of the wall panels. Uh, oh, and that's, that's what, what they're continuing. They've already. The wall panels, the weather things? The weather panels. The yeah, they, okay. they, they're just about getting ready to start at Avenue X on the other side. They've done both sides of um, uh, Ditmus and now the intermediate stations. They've started putting up the safety netting and they put up signs for the start of the project. Um, I don't have the floor, but I want to disagree with you uh, on, which on a point. Um, yeah. I am one of those end of the line F riders. I would benefit greatly, and I do because end of the they do. Where do you get on, Stuart? I, I get on at Neptune or at Avenue oh. X, uh, depending on the mood that I'm in. Uh, but the line does run express frequently, and, and they're using this pattern because they've had signal problems. That's another issue. But what's changed since the 1970s when I rode that express train uh, to go to work um, is you now have the R connection at. Um, at J Street, and you also now have G service that goes beyond uh, Fourth Avenue. So, yeah. so I don't think those intermediate stations are disenfranchised the way you think they are, because you have to look at where people are going, and the people that live if in they're going to Manhattan, right? Yeah. So they 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 wait another minute at uh, for the next connecting F train at Bergen Street. So, 
Um, and that was the last point I was going to raise, and we should have asked John O'Grady when he was here. I'm not sure Bergen Street lower level is in any shape. <laughs> it's been completely stripped, and on one of the sides they've built a new tower. It would really take significant investment to uh, reopen that. That's what I'm saying. So, so if they don't do that, you're also bypassing Bergen Street. No, but again, it's where the people are going, and I don't really believe that those communities are disenfranchised. And I think now that you have the connection at J Street for those other riders that would, you know, would be interrupted at Fourth Avenue, um, you also now have, because remember, it goes from Seventh to J Street. You now have other options uh, for connecting with the F uh, for the uh, Fourth Avenue riders. And you didn't have in the 70s the G making those stops. You didn't. We don't know how long um, after the L train work that those increased service Gs are going to be running, however. It's a significant time savings, especially in the evening. And there are many people that are traveling on that train to um, Church Avenue, 18th Avenue, 7th Avenue. Significant numbers of people. Um, any other uh, discussions? Chris. I agree with Stuart. Sorry. Oh, I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I just pressed the button. I don't think this mic comes back well, to life. Back a little. I did. I'm 50 feet away. I'm pushed away a little. Okay. Uh, let me just get to my point because everyone's going to start giving me the grief part. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I was saying, is Stuart is definitely correct because the F line, which I'm, I can see from my window, which is serious, I'm not joking, the only thing that people are very concerned is during rush hour, you do also have the F train terminated King's Highway. Now, what are we going to be doing with those F trains? Since now a Coney Island bound F has to come into King's Highway on the middle, which now a King's Highway F cannot come in. Assumedly, if there is F express service, the expresses go through to Coney Island and the locals would end at King's Highway like it used to be. I assume but that. it can't. One way train track. It's only three, not four. There are only three tracks. It happened before. Well, Houston, we're going to... The, the express would be in the predominant direction of travel. But here's the problem right now. As I've been reading this, and, it's, and I'm going to be honest with you right now, the officials have got to think about one thing. We've got to get this F construction finished first. That's the one thing that they're forgetting. And a lot of people are really pissed with the elected officials saying... Hello, people. You're forgetting about fixing the stations first because I don't want to go down looking at a hole in the ground in the street saying, look, I can see the ground or a stairwell collapsing. Like Smith Ninth? I'm not talking about Smith and Ninth. I'm That's talking about... Everybody was looking down at the hole through the hole there for years. How about Avenue U, Kings Highway? Let's talk about those stations. At least Neptune Avenue looks beautiful, but again, as I said, Andrew, you have during rush hours the F's terminate Kings Highway. There is going to be a problem now of train traffic now when they go all if they're all going to Coney Island we're going to have a problem because they're going to cause all train backup maybe all the way to Church Avenue which you technically have two ways of relating them over there better than Kings Highway and you still have a Coney Island bound F's they well, have I, to I redo some you, adjustments I can tell you that if if you're only going to leave riders at several rapidly growing stations with G train service when their destination is Manhattan and at a much lesser frequency than than they have now there's going to be it's already pitting elected official against elected official so we'll, we'll see what happens well um, we just got the work has to be done on the on the definitely list. the only thing no, I'm talking about go. Andrew the only thing I just want to make clear is the construction made. concern is right now I'm not worried about the F Express at this time their elected officials have forgotten about safety to our, their, their voters. No, they haven't. That's always the first thing they think about. Well, tell the truth, I've been talking to a couple of officials the last couple of weeks, and I can tell you this, as the borough president said, he wants the construction to go first, then worry about the F Express after. The concern is the safety, because you know there are three tracks. I'm the sure Brighton Line has four, which is a whole different ball game. But again, it's the safety concern. Stewart. I don't want to continue the discussion, uh, but before I was only talking about AM and PM peak in one direction. Of course. I'm not for anything other than that, but uh, um, Brennan, who visited us, alluded to a safety issue of um, 
vibrations and problems with running the service under certain homes. Uh, and uh, we were going to follow up on that. Yes, that's and, in and the ask him what he was talking between, about. Between Church Avenue and 7th Avenue. Yeah, because we've never It's under the heard, Windsor Terrace, actually. We've never heard area. that before from... Yeah, I, I've heard that from... Uh, um, fr at transit committee as well. well so you're right. I have I've heard that some he's the one basically that has complained about from those homes. And that was raised. I, I think I, I think the the response to that was that they would that they would go in and, and use and use cushion track and do everything they could do to re reduce the vibration. I mean that's okay. We have uh, some other uh, items to discuss. Um, Somebody want to begin? What was one of the other ones, Bill? Well, uh, one, well, one of the things we have to one of the things we have to do is we oh, traditionally no, nominate council officers because, as you know, Transit Riders Council elects its officers every year. Um, so we traditionally nominate uh, take nominations oh. for council officers at the at the, the the May meeting, and then we hold hold elections at June. And of course, people can be nominated from the floor. Or, floor at June, so there's a whole month to, to decide who, who might be, who might be. Oh, yes. Uh, it is May, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. And it, it, who might be uh, candidates for the, for the positions. One of the complications we have, sorry. One of the complications we have to, uh, this, this time, obviously, is, is that we, uh, we our, our vice chair, Mike Sinanski, ha has uh, resigned from the, from the council. So we have we have actually have a vacancy uh, potentially for one month one month between May and June, um, and you know technically technically we would fill that. I don't know if it's worth filling it for one for one month, especially since we're really not we're really not doing anything um, that I think is going to require a vice chair for the next month. Um, no vice. No, I don't think any vice. I think we're going to lay off vice for okay. for the for the month, um, and you know we don't have a, we don't have Andrews here. We expect him to be here in in, in June, so we don't so he doesn't need to, so he doesn't uh, we don't need a vice chair to preside. So it may be the, the the best course of action may may be just to elect a new vice chair in June and and let the let the position stay vacant for a month. Um, but the current the current um, the nerve of that Sinansky to do this to yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out that the one of the roles of the vice chair on this council, which doesn't apply to the other councils, is the vice chair of this council is on the executive committee of the PCAC. Yeah, that is true. That's true. Now that that of course would mean what one executive committee meeting. When is the next executive? We have we have a schedule. We have one scheduled, which we're going to have to reschedule on uh, in in yeah, June. And I'm going, right. yeah, it conflicts with the, conflicts with the meetings. I believe it's. Let me let me think here. I have. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I. June twentieth. Monday, June twentieth. June twentieth. We'll probably which is when the MTA committee meetings are. Yeah, we'll probably that'll have to be moved. We'll probably move back, back, back to the prior Wednesday. We, Andrew and I had talked about potentially. Is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Moving. Go ahead. Is it possible to just move up the nominating process one month and do it since we have a vacancy and we're going to just do it next month anyway? Well, you could elect, you know, you could elect, you could elect a uh, uh, somebody to fill the unexpired term and for a month. And then next, yeah, well, okay, month, well then today, can can I nominate someone? We're I would take all the nominations um, for the whole for the whole thing. For the whole for the whole thing. thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want to fill, if you want to fill the the unexpired term for the chair, we probably should do that separately. Vice chair, vice chair. The yeah, vice well, that's chair. That's what I'm. No, no, that's unexpired what I would, for the vice chair. That's you, what I would we like. We should probably do that separately, okay, and well, then can we and then do that first? To, can I do that first? Yeah, you're you're in the chair, Andrew. Um, you? Yeah, I mean, do, does the majority want like to do that today, or would you want, want to think about it and do it next month? I mean, the one month should make no difference. So we're all here. up to up to you. I think everybody is here except Sharon, right? Yeah. Is Sharon the only person not here today? I, I think Sharon is the only is the yeah. only person not here. Yeah, that's that's pretty good attendance. She's in. Yeah. Uh, She's in Siberia. Siberia, yeah. <laughs> Literally. Okay. Then 
Yes. May I proceed? Mm -hmm. Go okay. ahead. Well, I am just making a nomination to fill the vacancy, and then I would hope that if if that goes, then we nominate the rest also. Okay. Anyway, I would like to nominate Chris to fill the vacancy uh, as vice chair. Second. There is a second. Any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Marisol. Because he would be wearing two hats. So that's a declination, I assume? Are you declining? We, we do have, we do have uh, uh, in, the, in the bylaws of the PCAC a provision that, allow, that allows the, cha uh, the chair to, to appoint someone to 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 uh, you know to fill up if 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 someone has two holds two offices uh, uh, that that allow them to be on the executive committee that, that provide them executive committee membership um, there's a provision of PCAC bylaws that allows the chair to to appoint someone to to uh, take the take the position to maintain the voting strength Chair of just, the PCAC, it, it, chair of chair of the councils. Okay. It, it was done for. It, it, I'll explain why it was done, and maybe that'll make more sense. It was done for Randy because Randy's both chair of the PCAC and chair of the Metro North Commuter Council. Right. He has he has spaces on the executive committee under both under both hats. So this bylaw change was made to allow allow uh, basically allow uh, allow uh, Neil to to be the other executive committee member. He, he would get what, what what you would have is you would have somebody else somebody else somebody else appointed to be if, else if we know appointed, that this is appointed cause which may a not make and have a reappointment and an opening and everything why do it yeah I, I'm just I, I'm just no, giving nothing I'm, against you I'm just raising the possibility I'm not uh, I'm you know I'm not so advocating Randy it. Is, is someone who's also in that position though. Randy is in the same position and what the what what's done what's being done by Metro North is that he's basically given the given the proxy to Neil to, to act as the as the second Metro North member on the PCAC executive committee. Yeah. Do you accept? I think it's a yeah. The chair would. I think it's. I believe the. I. Be, I don't have the bylaw in front of me, but I believe it's the chair. Chair's prerogative to do that. But. Yeah. So, Bill, do you accept? <laughs> Vice chair. Yeah. Does not. Okay. 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 So. Um, yeah, yeah. Stewart is a member of the of the PC of the uh, N NYC TRC executive, executive committee, committee. Yes. but not the PCAC executive committee. All right. Any other nominations before? And I think we can do it again next next month, right? If they're open from the floor. Well, uh, the, the nominations are open until the election. We just okay. do it a month ahead to give people a chance so, to think. I'm sorry? Bird accepts. 
Any other nominations? Seeing none, we'll close the nominations for vice chair position. Uh, now we have to do the chair and what else? Um, and the executive committee, right? So, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Chair and executive committee nominations are now open. Fruity. I nominate Andrew to continue as our wonderful chair. Thank you. Second. Uh, and any any other executive committee members in that nomination or? Oh, who are the executive committee members now? Okay. Current, current, current officers of, of TRC, um, obviously Andrew is the chair, the, the, the vice chair position is, is now, is now um, vacant, yeah. um, and um, on, uh, members of the executive committee are Bill, Gil, Bill Guild, Marisol Halpern, and Stuart Goldstein. That's who, that's who it is. And, as well and as and the other, the, me, the, other officers. The yeah. 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 So that's, that's the slate, per se. Um, so, are you nominating for all, or just me, or how do you want to do that? Uh, well, it depends on, there's going to be a contested vote for vice chair. So, Obviously, yes. if one of those people doesn't get it, I would yeah. hope that they would then be put on the executive committee. So, I think we have to wait until next yeah. month. Yeah, correct. Well, we, uh, well uh, the, the nominations will still be open until until the election, so somebody could nominate. You can't nominate. wait till after the election to oh, see well, wait who a minute. Get But it. I know. But I thought we were not. We were going to right. elect just for one month to fill a vacancy. Right. This is this is then. unexpired. Uh, the the nominations that were made are for the unexpired term. God, things uh, were simpler at the DNC and up at the state yes. committee. Yes, they're for, for the unexpired the term. I, I wish I had. I wish I. I, I wish I had just. Uh, you know. <laughs> I wish I had just, uh, I had just let it pass, but uh, <laughs> next month, huh? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I felt well, like no, it I was, am I am just nominating. It was for somebody wants to nominate everybody else. All right, please? any other nominations for chair? And you can still do it from the floor next month. So now we have to ask for nominations for vice chair, vice chair, vice chair, and this would be for 2016, I 2017 term. Yes, not the one that Trudy, but the other. And I now nominate Chris for vice chair for the whole Long Megillah. Is that doable? You can. Good, then I'm doing that. I'm sorry, Maris. The vacancy one we've discussed already. This is for the other vice chair. That, that's that was sort of what I what I said. You, you don't necessarily nothing have to no. have to do it. You can elect to do it, but there's nothing pressing. Okay, then 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 my nomination for vice chair, instead of fulfilling the vacancy by Chris, is nominating Chris to run for vice chair for the for, whole for 16 year through 17. Exactly. Okay, so so do the do well. do do the the two nominees agree? That they that they are they're going to decline for the unexpired term, so we can we just say we didn't have any nominees and we just let it stay vacant for a month. Okay. Okay. So do we have everybody okay. nominated so, now? Is that true? Yeah. Um, the only thing would be the uh, the executive the members of the executive committee. And that's an elect. Those are elected. Those are elected. Okay. Yeah. So the, and that is currently um, Bill Stewart. Bill Marisol and Stewart are the members of the executive. The, the, uh, the at-large members of the executive committee as opposed Perfect. to the ex-officio ones. There's a second. Okay. Any other nominations for that group? Boy, this is complicated this time. Information. Yes. Uh, there, whoever loses for vice chair can then be nominated from the floor. For the executive I don't committee? know that they can no. because the election will have taken place, Trudy. Yeah, I think we we we, tra we traditionally do it as as one ballot. You can't really be in two places at once in that in that particular. We instance. traditionally do it as two, coming from a, a, as a single ballot. Coming from the Democratic State Committee, let me tell you, you can be in three places at once. Yeah, um, I, I actually I, I actually neglected to mention something on the W train discussion. Um, 
during, during the meeting, I had recommended that during rush hours, the W be extended to Brooklyn to fill the, uh, the, um, the Fourth Avenue local stations because the R does not run that frequently. Um, I was told that they didn't see a demand for that and they didn't have the fleet size for that. I then mentioned that in the previous incarnation of the W, it did pick up and, and uh, drop off passengers as it was coming, as it was deadheading or, you know, words to that effect, from, to and from the yard, and they said that they would continue to do that when the W comes back. So there will be some W service in Brooklyn when it comes back. It may not be at the optimum times, which I was hoping for, which was rush hours, uh, but it will be in the beginning, obviously, of the span of the W in the early morning, and it will also be, I guess, at 9 or 10 p.m. when the W yeah. uh, goes out of service. If you're, there, there are. Oh, I, they were? Yeah, I think oh. there are, I think there are, there used to be trains that would run like in the late 6 o'clock hour, yeah. and maybe even the early 7 o'clock hour were, were the latest ones that came into service. But anybody that's waited, you know, at 53rd or 45th or Union Street for just the R knows you need another service. Plus, you have Sunset Park is rapidly growing, and the Bush Terminal area is growing. So, right, and the other the other thing the other thing is that, that south of 59th Street uh, on the R, it doesn't the W doesn't do any good, no, whether it runs or not. So at least they will uh, they will have it pick up on its trips to and from the yard. So that's something. Did we have any other things to discuss, or are we ready for adjournment? There was some th something else. Oh. Yeah, oh, we, we did have yeah. a, there, we did pass out a, a resident, and you didn't get one, but. Oh, I don't have one. You don't have one, but, uh, <laughs> but um, we, what did are we, do a, we did do a resolution. Oh, resolu about Mike, of course. Mike, uh, which has been distributed. Which, which has been distributed. Um, if anyone would, would care to, care to. Shouldn't we add make a whereas and where he resigned a month earlier than he yeah, should we, have? Yeah, we could, we could do that. Where, whereas he <laughs> threw avoid the. chaos. <laughs> well, he, whereas he threw the, uh, the May meeting of the TRC into, into chaos. chaos. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would bitterly resent him for that. <laughs> Nevertheless, be it for <laughs> Nevertheless, we're going to give him, we're going to give him a plaque. Uh, no. I think we'll. I think what we'll do is we'll frame. We'll frame. We'll we'll do a better. We'll do a better version of this and frame it. Great. Any objections? Can we have a vote? All in favor? Aye. That's everybody. Acclamation. Acclamation. Um. Seriously. If you have strong feelings about the uh, service plan for the L, um, send them in to both the website and to Bill, and uh, we'll enunciate them at the various next steps where this is going to be discussed. But uh, I think by a lot of the polling that I've seen and from the public comments, at least at the Manhattan meeting, a lot of folks would like to see this be done and over with. Uh, sooner rather than later. Edith. I would certainly hope that we have looked too clearly at how ungodly and despicable it is at those two sites. We literally have to go around the clock. We, we, we noticed. I, you know, I really feel that is a very poor. I don't even know that, know that there was, there were a couple of steps up right in the front. I, was there a ramp there? The, it was, no, there, there was wasn't a ramp. The accessible yeah. location is on 13th Street, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. Yeah. And the signage tells you how to find the street. Right. Yeah. 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 Was there another venue they could have held on in the 14th Street area? I'm wondering. They were the 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 original plan. My understanding of, of this is, well, yeah, they could have done that. But but the but the original plan the better. original plan was to do it at, at 23rd Street. So the, I think there was a limited there That's were right. a limited number of of venues available on 14th 14th Street. Governor arranged it, I think. Yeah. Yes, it, it, a lot of this has has. Uh, Albany influence oh, in it. Of their presentation? Um, can we get a liquid copy? Oh, great. I'm sure. Ask for it. There's a lot of sensitivity about providing this stuff again because of the Albany influence, um, but we'll ask. 
yeah. um, if they're willing. To, they, they, the, most of this stuff has been out in public meetings, so they may be willing if to do can, it. If you can, see the video that they showed. It's on their website that they showed. That video was pretty amazing. I'd still like to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will. I, I will ask. I'm just. I, I, I'm just raising the possibility that they may decline to provide it to us. Uh, but you know. reinforcing that this might. But be we have it on. It actually, we have because because because, the, because this meeting is is filmed or, or taped or recorded, you can look at our. You can go to you, our YouTube channel and watch. You know, it's right up there. And there's a link to it from our the main page of our PCAC website. Yeah. It, it, you go to our website. You go to the go to. The, I I will ask, I I I I said I I I will ask, I will ask, but uh, I'm just giving up. I'm so just trying to give now options. That it's a public thing, and it has to I will, be made available. Yeah, I, I will give. I will ask. I saw that, and I didn't want to get into an argument, but as we do not have exit turnstiles, I'm wondering how they know where people were headed. There's more to that than we can get into. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. Have a great holiday weekend.